And that's where we cut the episode. We cut the thing, and now we go okay. off the. Now we go off the boat. We got a lot of questions for you, Ed. Sure, let's Hopefully do it. You're ready. All right, we're gonna yep. scroll back up here. Um, let's see here. Hello, hello, hello. Yay, we're excited for this. Um, somebody's lurking. Okay, important question: Do the Canadian military use moose as tank busters? No. You were talking. You were talking about the military early on, and some of the yes. the, the the role playing aspects of of the Canadian military. No, we do not use <laughs> moose as tank busters because in order to have tank busters, you need to have tanks. Tanks, right? <laughs> and here, and I and I got to throw this. I, I say make this comment all the time. Anytime I'm talking with someone from Canada. I'm from Minnesota, so I'm unofficially Canadian. Yeah. So, yes. <laughs> as Garrison Keillor said, almost good enough. Almost. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you were talking about the vans coming up to my front door. Just imagine playing a game and then getting the FBI sent to your door when you were talking about the uh, yeah the, the tapping the the sending diplomacy. The yeah. yeah. Diplomacy is the monopoly of RPGs. It ends friendships. <laughs> Somebody asked, yes. are you really El Minster in disguise? I'm asking for a friend. Uh, no, I am not El Minster in disguise. I just play him at play conventions him. in Have the there, same way. I've seen some art for some of the covers, and sometimes I wonder if they've actually based the art on you. Oh, yes. Yeah. They have. Okay. Yeah, because because if, if they saw me in costume as El Minster, which is, by the way, something TSR asked me to do. Okay. And then later on, Watsi asked me to stop doing. <laughs> I bet. Okay. Um, but they have seen me for years ad lib Elminster mm -hmm. at, at long play sessions. So, but but I I want to remind all the gamers who think that Elminster is my self insert Mary Sue. Got to remember when I created Elminster, I was five years old. Right. I did not have a beard. <laughs> I did not have white hair. I was not old and cantankerous. I was young and shy, and nerdy. I had black plastic, quote, unbreakable glasses. They weren't. I broke them over and over again. Right. <laughs> but I was not. Uh, I have grown to look like Elminster. And obviously with the artist, he has grown to look like me. Right. <laughs> well, full disclosure, there may or may not be a game that I run where, uh -huh. we, where we all play ourselves. And the, one of the backstories is you really are Elminster in our world, just hanging out and watching everything. So I'm okay. And this was after we already talked once, so I, I'm 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 okay. full disclosure. That's cool. There. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> um, what is your thought on? And of course, I, some of these questions may be things you can't answer. Uh, mm -hmm. What is your thought on the more recent explosion on the greater acceptance with D and D and role playing in general? And then he's got a follow up question. Sure, I think it's great for becoming mainstream. Right. Just as fantasy and science fiction became mainstream when it was this closet thing that was frowned upon. Oh, uh, even if there was no, isn't that satanic? Oh, then, God, you know, I hate God that. will curse you. Even, even if that wasn't there, there was the, oh, it's pulp. It will rot your mind. Why don't you read proper books sort of thing? Mm -hmm. So that was around long before that. And what happened was all the nerds like me got to be old enough and wealthy enough and high placed enough that they were running movie studios and they started making the movies they wanted to see when right. they were kids that nobody and they started publishing the fantasy books that they couldn't get enough of when they were kids so it became mainstream and i'm delighted that dungeons and dragons and role playing in general is now following the same thing because i it cuts down on all the oh i don't think you're Bobby should be playing that. It's Satanism. He'll have virgins down in the basement with black candles and doing unspeakable things to him. And then the police will come and his life will be over. It's like, no, no, no. You've just been role playing. This thing that we've just been doing sitting around, mom, dad, auntie, that's role playing. That's it. No right. virgins? No candles? No, that's it. You've just role played. <laughs> and, and I also want role playing to be associated with fun. Right. Because for a while there, corporate America had role playing, which was handling difficult customers. Right, right. The exit interview, how to get rid of a problem employee. Right. And of course, there were endless little videos made by Poface did the it's unless they were John Cleese and, and uh, <laughs> Dr. Buckman. Um, they were in which they would 
do the crazy interview and so on. And I don't want role playing to be associated with that in people's minds. I want it. No, role playing could be fun. It's make believe. Right. It's play. What we all did as kids, we're just refusing to grow up and putting away play. We yeah. want to go on playing for the rest of our lives. <laughs> my 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 own mother was one of those like that's it's evil. D and D is evil. I could role play GURPS. I could role play Car Wars. I could role play, but D and D was evil. She, and she D &D didn't D &D understand the separation until years. You know, I had I would we would sneak the D and D books in, and we'd be like, no, we're playing we're playing this other system, and we're not playing D and D. All right, what's what's my thaco? Uh, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, and and eventually, you know. Years later, probably not not too many years later, but five ten years later, it got to the point where my when I'd be visiting my mom, she'd be like, "What's the story? What's your guys' story for your D and D campaign?" I'm really curious what's going on in the thing. It's like the the evolution of it's evil to that point where it's it's not evil and it's storytelling and it's you know math building skills yeah. and it's social interaction skills and it's all of those things. It was just fantastic to see you know see evolve like that and i'm sure that that's you know kind of what this this question was doing his follow-up question was what do you see being the next big thing in the role-playing universe i i don't have a crystal ball right i know the old saying magic users have crystal balls but you know <laughs> um <laughs> but uh, i know that virtual reality the the goggles that make the world seem to come alive around you is going to be bigger than it is now right and is going and now the the question will be how can that be managed in a safe manner so we don't get the old um people running around in society doing dangerous things because they're seeing it as opposed to walking into traffic because they're texting right <laughs> yeah. um um there's the uh i uh, we already had a, a game uh beloved in my um teenage years called assassin or killer that was played at all conventions with a water pistol and a photograph everybody who was playing got a photograph of somebody who was their target and if they saw them at the convention they with the water pistol and they had to stop that game and ban it completely because somewhere in the united states a young kid made a firing motion with his water pistol and a security guard saw the movement turned and blew him away with wow. a real gun so they had that ruined it for everybody yeah that's sad. um but i mean that's the thing they have to avoid if they do virtual reality goggles right that that danger of somebody hurting themselves or hurting other people because right. they forget that they're in their bedroom or in traffic or in a in a public park or whatever i mean there was just been problems with pokemon go right with people wandering around public areas or trying to get into a cage with a lion at a zoo because there's a pokemon in there right no. <laughs> somebody mentioned you shouldn't eat books it's not good fiber i think you might have said something about consuming books consuming ah uh, yes uh, well do you have a favorite I, I beg to differ <laughs> do you books have a favorite noir <laughs> favorite noir era novel i don't have favorites um okay uh, one of the ones I like is a crossover novel that, that preceded Jim Butcher and preceded Glenn Cook. Um, Michael J. Reeves wrote Dark World Detective, and it's Sam Spade, but in a world of fantasy and oh. with monsters and stuff. Okay. And it's just fun. Awesome. Um, oh my God, I love that you had Maiden Ants. Yes, I had Maiden Ants, my Aunt Clara. My Aunt Clara went through two world wars and a depression on a dirt poor farm and then worked at Hudson's department store in Detroit where she, she um, altered people's hats to fit the customer's head. You put it on a steam mold, and you changed it, actually tear it to them. But then you decide, they decided what decoration they wanted, the ribbon and the feather or whatever. They decided that. And then you sent them on their way and she raised us all. And she, um, it was quite amazing going to a supermarket with a, a 70 year old lady with a widow's hump in full furs, full makeup, full perfume, jewelry all over her. And she's hobbling along and I'm there to push the buggy. And <laughs> she looks at the butcher's counter. She doesn't like any of the meat. 
and she just marches behind the counter and into the cold room. And with the, the meat cutter going, lady, you can't come in. And, and he looks at me like I'm supposed to stop her. Right. I'm like, I'm like eight years old. And I just looked at it and went, you know, <laughs> and she goes into the back room. And he's going, lady, you can't be in here. And she's in the cold room with full sides of beef hanging there. And she says, that one, I'll have that one. Take it down. And she, he's saying, but lady, and she says, take it down. You guys don't know how to butcher right. And, of course, here's the problem. English people, German people, and Scottish people butcher completely differently. Right. And then modern American guys who worked in slaughterhouses with rotary saws, they butcher differently yet again because they're not using cleavers. They're running right. it through a saw, so they're going to do it differently. And she wanted a whole side out, and then she picks up the cleaver again, not something that's supposed to be done. So he goes away to get the manager, and she's jointing this whole side of beef the way she wants it. And she wow. says, now, where's your brown paper? wrap it up in that's hilarious <laughs> oh my because gosh. well you you see he, she went through the wars you did everything yourself right you didn't you know um <sighs> no, she knew she knew at her age all bent over she couldn't carry a whole side of beef she that's what you were there for the floor <laughs> yeah well yeah except i couldn't either so that's what she wanted the meat cutter well it, you know carry it for me because i can't <laughs> right. it's sort of like wow and and this is how we went through life she was in perfume and furs she wore furs all over and she got dressed up to go out and you walked everywhere taxis were for the hospital and that was about it wow because taxis cost money right and she went through the depression right. so you walked everywhere right <laughs> this person says i loved colombo yeah <laughs> <laughs> this one's for me they said you're underestimating your thing. yeah just just one more just thing one more. Oh yes. Or if you're if you're a princess bride fan, right. as you wish. As you wish. That that's <laughs> I am a princess bride fan. Uh I'm also a wrestling fan, so Andre the Giant made that uh, big yes. for me. So, and of course, Andre the Giant had a bad back. Yeah. He couldn't carry anybody. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, they had to keep uh, uh uh the the princess on wires for the, yeah. the carrying scene. Yeah. Um Somebody says they think I am underestimating how old our viewership is. I think that's in reference to when I said nobody knows who Columbo is these days. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Somebody asked if they're sorry that they're late. Sorry. Uh, you, t you too can purchase an Underwood 8 from Etsy from between $240 to $750. Really? That's, that's, no, that I, think, I, I think they were, I think we're there commenting on your comment about the price range is back in the day to, to what they are now. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, this person came in, they said, I, I read dungeon D dragon and dungeon quite a bit. Uh, awesome way to counter the metagame. Uh, when you were, he's referencing when you were talking about, um, how you wouldn't actually say what the bad guys were in the room. You'd hint to what could be in the room as rumor. And they are saying that that's an awesome way to counter the metagaming that people do these days. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you see that that whole thing was antithetical to me, and I and yet it is now part of the game, fifth edition, and so mm -hmm. on. Um, oh, I want my character build to be like this. How can I get more spells? How can I? And it's like, no, that's min maxing. Stop it. Right. Role right. play your character. You know, instead of oh, I want my character to do everything. But you see, that's now the thing. Yeah. But it wasn't in the it wasn't the design approach for the game. And and I've watched the design approach from different editions change over the years. Oh, yeah. It's like um, the gods should be above the player characters. There should be NPCs that can do things that the player characters can't do versus the next edition. No, your player characters should be able to do anything they want. They should be able to kill gods and take their place. You know, and, and it was like, what? You know, <laughs> but right. I mean, it's just a different uh, approach to the what you want to slant the game for. Right. I still have old issues from the early 90s and 2000s. Ed, do you stay current on D&D editions, or do you have a personal favorite edition to play and or run? Uh, when I'm running, it's usually role-playing over rules, so it doesn't really matter. Okay. Um, when I'm running with my old original group, it's second edition, because we never moved, because they vote right. on anything. And what they voted was... We're going to use first edition, but we can use second edition bards as well as first edition bards. So they're basically playing AD&D 
with a few cherry picked things from second edition. If I'm running right now, it's usually fifth edition, just because most of the younger gamers, that's what they're used that's to. That's what they're used to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I've designed for every edition of the D&D game. Um, I'm not comfortable in fourth because I didn't design for it long enough. But other than that, I don't care. One, it's 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 storytelling, baby. Right. You know. <laughs> um, this person's asking a question we already asked. Um, <laughs> we were talking about when you were giving tips on building a building a world or a campaign setting. This person says, "What about playing four or five hours just designing a vault?" And I know what this person's referencing because they're in a game I run. <laughs> Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, mm. I think they're I think they're literally just so for clarification I ran this, uh, for, for the viewers and for Ed who's now probably secretly judging me on the side uh, I ran a campaign where the idea was it was a lot of newer players and I wanted to I want to give them an option all, all of the different options that there were in you know, role playing, and so there was this option of they they were in this group and they had the money to do it. And the idea is travelers would come by their location uh, that are part of their organization. Their secret organization would come by there to stay, and in order to help that little their little enclave, their little safe house, people would donate money. You know, adventure. So a level eighteen adventurer might stop by and drop a bunch of money to help support their you know a safe place. And so they were like, they were told, okay, well, you need to make sure you have a safe way of storing this money in a vault. And you have, this is how much money you have. And so they literally role played in character mm -hmm. discussing how to design the vault. Yep. And so while on paper, it it's like spend four or five hours role playing, designing a vault. But then when you think about, okay, but it was all in character or was yep. mostly in character. That's a little bit different story. And I thought it, no, I thought it was a great idea. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. The Home Realms campaign, I never say, okay, we're going through Tomb of Horrors tonight or whatever. Right. Or White Plume Mountain or whatever. I never, ever do that. What happens is, in character, my players discuss, have their characters discuss what they're going to do in the world. And then go and do it. They have a council of war. And everybody speaks as their character. And they've got side fiddles. They've got day jobs. They've got investments. They've got people they want to check up on socially. And then they go adventuring. But they all do it in character. So, yeah, it can be three or four hours of talking. And right. No weapons drawn. And we don't care because we're having fun in the world. Scribbler says, I would play the hell out of that. <laughs> Two horrifying words. Shopping episodes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let me tell you stories. Um, I once wrote a hilarious story, which they deep sicked because it was extremely tasteless and bawdy. I love it. Um, in which a party of D and D adventurers, uh, um, from the realms, um, go shopping in a modern supermarket. You know, of, of well, okay, modern, modern of the 1960s. So rotisserie okay. chicken. Yeah. A real butcher behind the counter, um, uh, a produce manager with about five assistants, all wearing green aprons, who are fiddling with the produce throughout the day. You know, as people yeah. buy, they're restacking yeah. and putting stuff in pyramids and so on. And these adventurers are going spearing things on their weapons and putting them in the <laughs> cart. And and what <laughs> one of the, the they they encounter a kid having a meltdown, full temper tantrum banging his fists on the floor and his mother is despairing and he says, oh, I can't take you here. What am I going to do with you? And the fighter just reaches down and picks the kid up by the hair, dumps him in the buggy, says, we'll take care of him for you. <laughs> nice. <laughs> they're going to sell him into slavery, you know. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> um, somebody said, oh, so you were talking about putting, when you were talking about building, writing storylines and you talked about having a music video up and turning the music off. Mm -hmm. And writing, you know, writing from that. And this person mentioned an emperor's new clothes panic at the disco. I want somebody's story to that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, again, don't have the music to set your mood. 
I don't have the lyrics to tell the story. You right. just want to see the picture, what's on screen, mm -hmm. and for how long, and what, and the sequence of storytelling. What's the minimum you can do to tell a story? Because you're going to add stuff on top of that. You're just trying to get the skeleton, yeah, the plot skeleton. Rockheim says, "Do you wish? Did you at the time wish to be more than just freelance when you were working with TSR and Watsi, or do you prefer not being on their staff?" Oh, it's not a case of preference. Um, I was offered jobs about five times by TSR. And um, usually by Jim Ward, because he was creative director at that point. And I turned them down every time because um, I worked in a really crappy public library, uh, really crappy pay. The, the work was lovely. I love it. And I'm still working in public libraries today because I love the work, but the library um, work has always been underpaid. You know, it, it's a female dominated profession until this thing called pay equity came along. Everybody was paid less. But even then, growing up in Ontario with healthcare, Medicare, you know, I, I would be better paid than all the starting designers at, uh, at TSR right, right. and I have full medical and dental. You know, and they'd say, but we'll give you this. We'll give you a 401k. And it was like, yeah, um, you guys don't understand Canada, do you? Right, right. We start at the bar is up here. And you guys have got, you don't even give your vice presidents that. So right, <laughs> now, right. on the other hand, some of the vice presidents were, were taking $200,000 as an annual salary. You can buy a lot with that. Right. But I mean, and whereas I was stuck at about. 17, 18, 19 thousand dollars as an annual salary. But when you have your home and family and everything you know, you just don't want to uproot and move. Right. I realize that many Americans of my generation were used to traveling all over the country, relocating every few years to a new right. job. I didn't want to do that. I, you know, but but I will say TSR in particular, I loved. It was like a a family more than a business. Now, sometimes it was like a dysfunctional family, right? <laughs> but but um, I loved it. I loved going there, and I would go there once a year at Gen Con time, purely for tax reasons. I had to be out of the country for a full week plus a day because you couldn't count the day you'd cross the border. So for, just for how much I could bring back through customs, and I was going to Gen Con and buying games. So uh, twenty five dollars wouldn't cut it, you know. Right. Um, Besides, the Canadian customs guys had this trick. They'd say, so where'd you go? You'd tell them. So did you gas up the car? Oh, yeah. Oh, there's your 25 bucks. Ha, ha, ha. You have to pay duty on everything in the car because, you know, you oh. spend it on your gas. It was right. like, oh. But if you stayed away for more than a week, it was like $200 or 240 or something. So you could you could buy a few games that you couldn't find at home. Right. Anyway, so so I would go to TSR and hang out before Gen Con, work Gen Con for them not for pay and then then go afterwards and hang out and it was great fun and i loved it i would have loved to be in there if i could somehow um relocate tsr there to my go. backyard i right. would have done it in a shot yeah so you no know, i i don't mind um not being a staffer because in particularly in tsr days i was the father confessor for everybody at TSR. So they'd phone me at the public library and bitch about whatever had happened in the <laughs> office. And then I would go, uh-huh, uh-huh. And, and I'd put down the phone and then it would ring again. It would be the other part of the feud, the other side. And I have to pretend I hadn't heard the first one. Right. And I'm sure in some cases they were testing me to make sure, is this guy going to keep his mouth shut? And right. I did because I never wanted that pipeline to, to shut off. Right. So yeah, a lot of people at TSR became my friends. And it happened the same way with Wizards, but Wizards was changing constantly because as Hasbro bought it, they were downsizing it. Yeah. So the people I was used to seeing there, well, they purged so many people that we got Paizo out of it. You know, a one fell swoop. And then, but so it was different. Every time I visited, there were fewer people there. Okay. Did you work on the Pools of Darkness series? Uh, yes. Uh, I actually wrote a short story, which has never seen the light of day since oh. um um for broderbund um night on the cold hillside i think um that was published in the game manual for one of the early ones okay yeah yeah cool uh what has your experience been on the publisher side of creating rpgs books etc uh 
being a publisher. Mm-hmm. I guess um, that's, I'm assuming that's what he means. Yeah. Uh, I don't have enough time left in my life. I certainly don't have enough money. The old joke about um, how do you make a small fortune in publishing? Start with a large one. Um, <laughs> and, Sorry, I don't mean to laugh, but that's a great line. You know, <laughs> but and and the other thing is, um, there were so many little details. I have vast admiration for people who can turn out good looking products. You know, when you when you just can't get the layout right and so on. You see, because I'm old school. Layout for me was exacto knives and a waxer. And you cut and pasted things and you right. laid it out. And if you needed corner thingies or artwork, you drew it yourself and slapped it on the page. And right. then you cut the text, literally cut it with an exacto knife to flow around things. Right. None of this newfangled computer stuff, because there was no computer <laughs> stuff any. until I was a teenager and I was a journalism student. And we had one computer in the building, which ran the waxer and ran the layout compositor. And all of us worked on typewriters. Right. <laughs> What is your favorite novel in an RPG setting that you did not write? Mm. Again, I don't have one favorite. I have several. Uh, Homeland by Bob Salvatore, yep. which brought Menzel Branson to us. Brilliant book. The one that is dearer to my heart is Elf Shadow okay. by Elaine Cunningham, mm -hmm. because I thought she read my mind and got water deep. Exactly right. Then there are books that are as single sitting treasures I really enjoy. Uh, City of the Dead by Rosemary Jones. Um, Down Shadow by Eric Scott to be. Um, Susan Morris's short stories that she did in um, the Realms anthologies. Uh, the God Catcher by Aaron Evans, and then later watching her do the Brimstone Angels series and watch it unfold, because we talk quite a bit. Um, she, I, and Brian Cortijo, who is a fan who is the master of Cormier, we, we would lore talk all the way around on those books because Erin wanted to tell her own story, but she wanted to get all the Cormier lore exactly right. So we would talk back and forth, like, what sort of plants would be growing there? Here you go. Uh, what lo what lord or, you know, servant could I use? Oh, here you go. You know, right. <laughs> um, so that, that was great fun. And the end result was beautiful. Um, then there are the role-playing books outside the realms. And it was, I was quite intrigued with what uh, originally Andre Norton did with Quag Keep, the first official D&D novel written by Andre Norton back in the day. Okay. And um, late, later on, uh, what Joel Rosenberg did with his Guardians of the Flame, which was uh, a role-playing crew discovers that the world is real and they're in it. Um, and it was, yeah, and there were various um, other people, Dave Bischoff and others did, did, and there were, um, there was a, um, a children's author of great fame called Dala Vipkar, who did the Warlock of the Night, and the Warlock of the Night is a fantasy novel, but it's based on a chess game being oh. played, so it's the Black Queen and the White Queen nice. and all the rest of it, but not, not done like Alice in Wonderland, not done, or Alice the Looking Glass, excuse yeah. me, but not done that way, but done straight. And, wow. and uh, yeah, and there, the, so there's, and you see, when you're old enough and you worked in public libraries, you get, you get this cavalcade of books. I have 200,000 books around me in this house. So <laughs> just a couple, just a few books. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Just a few. So I've, I've seen various people doing their try and take on it. And some of them are really cool. Nice. Um, regarding fate of the Norns, shut up and take my money. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is going to be fun. It is going to be good, and it is consuming all my time. Like today, I just rewrote a city block from the super detailed one that is like 5,000 words long down to one that will fit on a page. So you'll have a map of the city block and little things like a tourist guidebook. You know, this restaurant is here. This blacksmith is here. You know, so I had to condense it. And I've got 98 city blocks to do. So This person says... Uh... My headcanon is that you were born with a beard. Ah! <laughs> and, this, and the other, the, uh, another one after that goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what an archmage would say. I made him up when I was five. <laughs> well, I did. I was, that, I was that weird thing called a child prodigy. And then things went so. <laughs> uh, this person says they shudder at Thacko. 
Why? <laughs> Thacker was so easy. You said to the dungeon master, what do I need? And the dungeon master said, shut up and roll the dice. And then he'd look down and said, you missed him. Or you hit him. Oh, wow. You golfed his head into the middle of the next week. You were role playing, not R-O-L-L -L, role playing. So that's, it that's doesn't matter. That always, that's the comment I always make. Role playing versus roll. Yeah, roll. Yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. I make the shaking of the dice. Um, some of these, some of these, I'm not sure because we bounced around a little bit here in the chatting. Sam Spade, well, that's awesome. Uh, looks like Reverse Karen doesn't speak to the manager, but does it all herself. I think you're talking about the in the butcher yep. shop. Yeah, clear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and somebody's. Yep, that reminds me of my great grandmother too. Yeah, yeah. They built women in those days, and they ran the world. When all the guys went off to war to get killed, the woman had to take over. And then all the men would come back and all the women would be kicked out of the job so the men could have their jobs back. But they hadn't forgotten how to do it. So I, mean, I can remember right. um, and my father couldn't start the car, couldn't start the Polara. And Aunt Clara comes outside in her apron and little gingham dress. And she says, pop the hood, Bob. And he gives her the look. Pop the hood, Bob. Because she figured it was a car with a carburetor instead of fuel injection so she would probably still know how to fix it and she did too <laughs> you jam the carburetor open with a screwdriver <laughs> there okay so you got a you got dirt in here this whole system's dirty and it's going to have to be cleaned out but if you need to start it in the parking lot just carry this screwdriver under your under your front seat and jam it in right here like this <laughs> <laughs> My father walked away with new respect for Ed, Clara. Right. Uh, this person says, I honestly would love for Ed to come back. You have so much knowledge and stories. And oh. if you guys find your way to Washington, I'll take you out for drinks. All right. Okay, sure. Uh, I would love to come back. Sure, yeah. Uh, Washington State or Washington, D.C.? I think he's in Washington State. Ah, lovely. Okay. Uh, I need a fam familial dispute settled. Is there uh -oh. such a thing as too many dice sets? <laughs> no. There you go. As a gamer, the answer to that is no. I, in the days of Gen Con, I would always go to the chess X booth and do that scoop with a plastic pitcher for you scoop it through all their seconds. And I would do that. And every new employee that was my minder at Gen Con, because TSR turning into WOTC, they always had a an Ed minder these poor ladies would, would be would make sure I got to my panels at the right time. I would always go and buy them the, their first set of dice. Oh, wow. At, nice. at the chess X booth and let them pick one because the first time they see all these dice, they're overwhelmed. Right. And then they go, look at the prices. Oh my God, I can't afford that. Well, sure you can because I'm going to pay for it. For nice. You. Get the dice you want. Because, hey, you can never have too many dice. You can never have and too I many have dice. And I have crystal dice. I have see-through dice. I have metal dice you can kill people with if you throw them. You know, um, I have Put them in a slingshot. Bone. Yeah, yeah. I had knuckle bone dice, all sorts of dice. And and the Zachi Hedron from Lou Zaki, you know. Do you have more, more dice than books or more books than dice? Oh, more dice. Uh, no, more books than dice. <laughs> Long shot. Because that's the other thing. I have so many dice that I have this big bowl of dice and gamers who come pick some to use that night and take them away with them. And I don't care. I've got dice. Oh, and here's another trick. I'm going to, yes, you can all do the, the crown Royal bag and everything, but if you need a traveling set, you go to a dollar store and get a cheap eyeglasses case with a snap thing. Oh. And they hold two of everything in a complete nice set. Nice. Nice. There we oh, go. And, and Gee, when you're going role playing hacks from Ed Greenwood. Dun, dun, yeah. dun. And if you put that in your pocket when you're going through the customs at the airport, you'll get fewer questions. They can still see that there's dice inside and not a pair of eyeglasses, but they sort of say, nah, whatever, because it looks normal. They <laughs> right. might open it to make sure it's not plastic explosive, but right. you just tell them, please hold it level when you snap it open. <laughs> Why? Because the bomb's going to go off? Yep. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, this person says twenty thousand books. 
question 200,000 200, books yeah <laughs> and if you add in the comics and so on we're getting up to 300,000 <laughs> makes notes got to increase my personal library yes you better reinforce your floor this person says the math I think they're talking about the FACO again they're, they keep going back to the FACO <laughs> There, there is a whole section of the feminine mystique about how women had to step back after the 40s, but never forgot. Yep, Good that's job. right. Oh, yeah. Because they knew they could do it better than the men. Because they'd done it for a couple of years, you know? Right. I make and sell knit and crochet dice bags. Nice, Maeve. Nice. Uh, if there's no other questions, then... We'll, we'll give it a few seconds if they have if they have a few more. Otherwise, we can be done for the evening. I'd like to thank everybody in the stream uh, who is new, who has followed us today. Casual Air, uh, somebody that's got a lot of letters and numbers in your name. Haas312, uh, yeah. Artist Alfred, I know, Order 11, awesome. Thank you all for joining us and joining the interview. And everybody else that's, you know, already part of here, if you're not following us, that's great. Uh, but feel free to follow us. There will be lots more interviews. And Ed already said he's going to come back. Sure, yeah. Uh, a lot of people saying thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you for joining us.